Welcome to a very special edition of Tim's Vinyl Confessions. I'm Tim Burling. This is Matt Phillips. And for the first time on one of our episodes, longtime friend of the show, Andy Campbell, known to all as okay. Bug. Nice to have you here. Thanks for having me, guys. And uh, the subject today, uh, the reason that we decided to have Andy, we knew he'd be a good guy to bounce things off Absolutely. of and, and have a lot of vinyl uh, from what we're talking about. We are going through our, between the three of us, we compiled a list of the, our top 30 albums from 30 years ago, from 1989. And uh, 1989 was, I was going to speak for myself, and we can each talk about our memories there. So I would have been 14 going on 15 in 1989. So, um... I've long said this, my personal taste in music, from 1986 to about 1991, <laughs> for me, golden age of rock and roll. And so 1989 kind of sits almost in the middle of that. I think that it was a period of time that will, and I don't want this to sound too much like an old man rant, but it's probably going to. Uh, it's a time of music that won't exist again. And I was thinking about how, because I work in radio and how fragmented radio stations are. There's a rock station, there's a pop station, there's a country station. Um, if you were to go back and listen to an average top 40 radio station in 1989, there's a lot more variety than people give it credit for. Because, uh, you know, in that whole pop period from 86 to 91, I was thinking about this, bands that were popular. To listen to an hour's worth of a top 40 station, yes, it would be primarily pop driven. So you'd have Madonna, uh, Paul Abdul was really big then. You'd have New Kids on the Block, like some of the early boy bands. You would have um, your, you know, your perennials like Billy Joel, Elton John. You'd have your just standard rock guys like Tom Petty were, all, were having hits. You'd have Skid Row, Warrant, Winger, Def Leppard, Bon Jovi. And you'd have, you know, what's now referred to as alt rock because you'd have R.E.M. Jane's Addiction. Or the, the Cure. Yeah. Uh, I know they were globally big, but they certainly weren't a hair band. U2, Midnight Oil. It was quite varied, and you just don't get that anymore. And one of the things that I noticed that happened is that rock bands stopped having legitimate hit singles. That's the first thing that would happen with these bands. They'd stop having hit singles, they'd continue to sell albums, then they'd stop selling albums. But the first thing to go is that they didn't have hit singles. And I'm sorry, I'm not stepping on toes of anybody that's happening today. I'm talking about rock bands. I'm not talking about Imagine Dragons or uh, uh, 21 Pilots, those are not Coldplay, that's not rock. Let's not kid ourselves. I'm talking about guitar-based rock. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, when the grunge bands came out, they were very successful, but they didn't have, for the most part, hit singles, per se. So you didn't have, that's why you don't longer have the anthems that people go back to and, you know, Tom Cruise makes horrible movies about. <laughs> um, so to me, it was, it, was, it was really the end of an era. And in 1989 in particular, just seems like a year when a lot of bands were not only were doing well, but they were at a creative peak. What were your thoughts, Andy? Absolutely. It was before the, the grunge took over and, the, and those bands were huge. Bon Jovi, Skid Row, Def Leppard, they were... You know, they were all over the Billboard 100 albums. They and, were all and, over the, and the radio. And much music. Yeah. The videos were huge. Everybody at least knew of them, right? Right. And they had a, a wide audience from, from adults to teenagers. They were selling a lot of albums back then. Because that was pre-internet. So people were still buying albums. Yeah. And a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I just remember discovering so many bands just in that era. Like, we're going to talk about some bands that their first album... Is on this list. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like it, they they took a few albums to get really good. It was like, there it is, and it doesn't get much better. That's right. Yeah. Now the trouble with that is, is sometimes it's hard to follow up. But uh, yeah, just there was a fertile, it was a fertile time for uh, the music that primarily we all kind of grew up listening to. So we're all about the same age. So yeah, we're gonna delve back into um, you know the year the, the Berlin Wall came down. The year of you know this is different things that were going on the end of the 80s and uh you know as a child of the 80s i loved it you know it was it was great and uh, you know some of us have early concert memories that i do not have yeah so let's uh let's get started guys so matt tell us how you arrived at this chart oh so what i did i asked andy and tim to submit their top 20 records and I did as well, and then I kind of ranked them by points. So actually, uh, your favorite record would get 20 points. The next one's 19, 18, all the way down the line. 
we compiled a pretty interesting list yeah. and um, the guys have a lot of them on vinyl um, I've got like 10 of them anyway to show you we've got some different variations yeah. and I was surprised but not surprised by uh, the ones that made the top five uh, especially the first one uh, I kind of knew going into it what it would be and yeah. it turns out we were right yeah <laughs> number one on all the lists. Yeah. yeah it's a debut album <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to start off with uh, number 30. I uh, think that's you. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm the only one who has this. You've seen this on a previous episode. Yeah. Uh, I won't talk too much about it, but this is the debut and I guess the only album. I think, from the, I think it's the only album. The Canadian band White, White Heat. Heat. So at the time when this came out, it had a little bit of that um, Danger Danger, a little bit of Def Leppard, a little bit of Duran Duran kind of sound. So... Um, I don't know, I kind of really got into it. Um, they had one video yeah. on Much Music. I was surprised to see, actually, so yeah, they had uh, uh, Crazy For You and um, Rolling With The Thunder were kind of like the, I would say Crazy For You was the, the bigger single off okay, of it. I, I was kind of surprised, Jim Galloway, I looked him up, he's still making music. He's okay. still part of, he signed a record contract with CBS and he's still with them. So. Wow. Yeah. Must be a behind the scenes guy. It's funny, I don't recognize any of the names on that list. It, no, when, I uh, couldn't find any info about anyone else. The only thing I, I thought of originally, I kind of knew they were Canadian, but I, at the same time, I know that the band Firehouse were originally called White Heat, so I thought okay. maybe this was, yep. but it's not. It's a totally he's different band. He's from Saskatoon and apparently he, uh, Saskatchewan, he's still in that area. Yeah. So, wow. 30 years later. Huh. And I've actually never even heard of White Heat oh, until... Oh, they never heard of you either. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of the record. And I feel I have a pretty good, uh, you know, depth of knowledge in this kind of music. And that's yeah. one band I just, yeah, I, I never heard of. So I'll, I'll definitely be checking them out. Okay. Uh, number 29. Hope we'll let Andy take this one. Okay, this is Tom Petty, Full Moon Fever. Uh, most of my collection is hard rock, but I do, I do love Tom Petty. And I do have this on vinyl, which is... It's not the easiest vinyl to find, and I actually stumbled upon this. Somebody gave me a box of records, and it was mostly stuff I wasn't interested in, but yeah. this was in it, and wow. I was and to happy be, to... To be fair, I actually ranked this one, so this is why you're seeing Tom Petty on Tim's <laughs> Right, this wasn't list. on my top 20, yeah. uh, because my list was all... I, I left out uh, anything that wasn't hard rock, but I definitely do love this album. Yeah, This was his first... His that, first that solo wasn't album. credited to the Heartbreakers yet. I'm pretty sure most of the Heartbreakers yeah. play on this because Mike Campbell is a yeah, co-producer. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so you're talking about Free Fallen, I Won't Back Down, yeah, and Running Down a Dream. Down a dream. This is a big album big for album. him. Yeah. 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 Uh, pro is it his biggest selling album or is it Damn the Torpedoes? I bet you this might this could be Probably, his yeah. most commercially successful of all that. Ooh, that's really nice. So that comes with a uh, wow, wow, wow that's cool. poster as well. Don't have that one. I gotta get a copy of that sometime. Cool. All right. Next up, this is a band that um, Matt's actually seen in concert, and they both have the record. I don't have it. Mine is still has some plastic on yeah. it. This is uh, the debut album from Jason Bonham's band. So Jason Bonham being the son, son of, of John Bonham, Led yep. Zeppelin, uh, the Disregard of Timekeeping. Yeah. This uh, was a gold album, I think. I think this did fairly well for them. Yeah. yeah. Produced by Bob Ezrin. Bob Ezrin, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Daniel McMaster is the singer. He's Canadian. Sadly, he's passed away. He died very young. Yeah. So um, in 1989, uh, this band and another band we're going to talk about later, my very first concert, uh, these guys opened up. And here in Fredericton. At the Aitken Center. At the Aitken Center. Which is crazy. So yeah, the Bo a Bob Ezrin production. So next up, uh, we've been talking about some Canadian people. Let's get into some Canadian uh, records. The biggest party in Canada, they call them sometimes. <laughs> uh, Kim Mitchell, Rockland. This was his, um, so his, not counting his debut EP, this was only his third solo album. It came out in 1989, and it uh, actually it was on Atlantic Records in the States. This is a Canadian copy on Alert. And um, at this point, he was a, Pretty big rock star here in Canada, you know. He had uh, a lot of a lot of hit singles. This was another big album for him. Rock and Roll Duty came off of this one, and also Rockland Wonderland. Great guitar player. Um, this is the inner sleeve, and you don't see this one on record so much. You usually see you'll see a Kimbo logo, and you'll see Shaking Like a Human Being, but uh, you don't see Rockland on vinyl that much. 
didn't, I mean, it came out in the States, but he never really broke into the States. And it's uh, not my favorite of his album, but it is a good one, and it came out in 89. Okay. Next one on our list. Um, I actually just got this record literally like an hour ago. Yeah, this is... Uh, so this is Joe Santriani's his third album, I believe. Uh, he had a couple of EPs, but I think it might have been his third. Yeah, technically. So right after right. Surfing with the Alien is Joe Satriani's Flying in Blue Dream. And I have to give all the credit to Andy. <laughs> Literally, uh, last week we were talking about this. I'm like, does anyone actually own this on anything? I have <laughs> to get it on there, but um, I've never actually bought it. This guy goes to a record store, <laughs> just randomly finds, finds it. finds it. Unbelievable. Couldn't yeah. believe it was sitting in the So in did the you ha You must have been familiar with this album. Did you have it on cassette at one time? No, I never. It's just I, I never owned it. Oh, okay. But, um, but you were familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Flying in a Blue Dream is, is a song that is still kind of in his set list. Yeah. Um, it's got all, like, like with Joe Satriani, you're going to get all kinds of different genres and stuff. Yeah. There's stuff on here that sounds like... Um, his version of ZZ Top at the time. Big Bad Moon. He sings on this album. Yeah, he does sing. Because like I remember seeing like the video on the Power album. Hour on Much Music. Yeah. Back to Shalabal. I actually thought that was a place, but it's actually, I did a little research on it. That's a, a character in the Marvel Universe oh, that okay. has something to do with, with the, the Silver, Silver Surfer, Surfer. who was oh, okay. pictured yeah. on the cover of Surfing with the Alien. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, so literally, this is the first time I'm actually seeing yeah. this record. Oh, wow, man. And, and Joe is still pumping out albums today, and yeah. uh, as Matt and I talked about in our uh, in an upcoming episode, we'd like to see good. another Chickenfoot album, because huh, yeah. uh, they were both really good, and Joe's guitar player on that. Relativity Records, that was the Shredder guitar player label of choice. Steve Vai was on that label, and a bunch of other Thanks. Shredders. No problem. <laughs> I'm glad I could find that. Yeah, that, that was a good, really, really good time. What's next? Ooh. So next up is, um, it's... It's 1989. I don't have this on vinyl. I do have it on CD, but I figured back in 1989, I was buying cassettes, uh, even though I wasn't, um, I wasn't a Kiss fan at this point. But, but uh, this is Ace Frehley's Trouble Walkin'. Uh, this came out in late 1989, and this is actually, of the albums that Ace put out in the late 80s, this is the first one uh, that actually wasn't under the Frehley's Comet banner. His first album... It's, late, it's uh, credited to Ace Frehley, but the album's called Frehley's Comet. This one he just has his own name on, and uh, this is on Atlantic Records, Megaforce Records to be exact. This is a U.S. cassette. You can tell it's clear colored like that. And um, it's, it's fairly low on my list because, and I'll be honest with you, I don't really think that Ace has a solo album that I actually like from start to finish. Um, I love the, the single off of here was a cover of ELO's Duo, which I absolutely love. It sounds like it, he, he could have written it. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point where if I do hear the, the ELO version of it, I think it doesn't sound quite you right. You guys have a knack for taking somebody else's song and putting his little spin. Yeah, and, and not picking, at least at this point, not picking the obvious one. The, there's a few other curiosities about this album. One is the fourth track on here, which is called Hide Your Heart, which came out right around the same time as another album we're going to talk about. So there were three or four competing versions of this one song. And it's so funny that Ace did a song when he was not in Kiss that's essentially a Kiss song. It was a Paul Stanley, uh, Diane Warren um, right. composition. Uh, other than that, you know, Too Young to Die is an interesting song because Peter Chris actually sings it. And on, I think it's Back to School, you've got, uh, I think, two or three members of a band that was just hitting their stride this year, which we're going to talk about later, who were all enormous KISS fans, uh, fulfilling a dream to be on an Ace album. Uh, Five Parent Studs, okay, Shot Full of Rock, but like, I think all of Ace's albums have some filler on them. This might be his best from start to finish. So I still want to find this on vinyl. I don't have it on vinyl, but that's my copy of Trouble Walking on cassette. I never knew Do You was actually a cover yes. until many it's, years later that it was an ELO song. It doesn't sound anything like Don't Bring Me Down or, or any no. of their songs, but yeah, it is. And it's not that different. No. The, the, yeah. All right, so next up, I believe you're holding on to it. This is the debut album by Junkyard. Um, love this album. These guys are a blues rock kind of outfit. Uh, not sure exactly where they're from. They might be from Texas. But uh, the song Hollywood was the uh, the big song. Got a lot of airplay on uh, Headbangers Ball and, and the Power Hour. Yeah. Um, 
the whole the second side not not my favorite but the first side from start to to finish is is a great side and uh, these guys didn't really make it that big their second album is also really quite good but this is the debut from junkyard nice. produced by tom worman that's a pretty okay. big name in motley crew and poison and cheap trick and so look at the back of that they were uh, from what i recall but they were a little bit like a gnr type yes band, weren't they? more they got lumped into the hair metal um yeah. category but they were more guns and roses than, yeah. than check them poison out. and like guns and roses they were also on uh geffen records and, yeah geffen yeah cool nice do a quick look at the uh oh that's cool cool uh, artwork on the and i believe in recent years they've actually reunited is that right in some form or another I actually okay. found a recent sealed copy of a CD they put out in 2017 over at Digital World. Wow. For a buck. <laughs> wow. Wow. I still haven't listened to it, but... Cool. All right, next up. Now, next up, this is a band that you would think that I would be way, way into. This guy right here. First, oh, man. First album from Danger Danger. So, Danger Danger is Ted Poley, the singer. Yeah. And on this album is a guy called Andy Timmons. Yeah, who uh, he's really big in the guitar instructional oh, scene. Oh, he does and, clinics uh, and yeah, he's an amazing guitar yeah, they player. They still talk about him. But, uh, um, now, I, there's a uh, the big song off of this was called "Bang Bang," Bang which was a very much in the vein of like a Bon Jovi "You Give Up a Bad Name" type of song, and it's a cool little song. It's just ear candy, is what it is. Very nearly hit the top forty, and I like that song. And the rest of it's okay. It's not yeah. bad. I just never gonna do. Naughty Naughty was another. Yeah. That was a. Everything has to be said twice. Naughty Naughty Danger Danger Bang Bang. <laughs> One of those bands that if they'd come out like maybe three years earlier, they might have had a little bit more success. They might have gotten more of a foothold. They've been through various incarnations since then. Just curious, who did the artwork for this album? Oh, uh, I had that on my notes. Nancy Donald, David Coleman, illustration Mark Ryden. Yes, Mark is, he's known for, he actually did the artwork for Aerosmith's Love in an Elevator. He has that kind of... I can see that, yes, thing, so. I can see, I can, I can picture that. Very cool. All right, now, now for something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> Going from Danger Danger to Testament. And take that album cover. Really cool album cover. Uh, some thrash metal out of the Bay Area. This was like their third. I think album it was their third song. album, but really the one that kind of got them on Headbangers, Headbangers Ball, Ball and Power and Hour, yeah. With uh, Practice What You Preach, the uh, title song, as well as um, the ballad is the other. That's not. The, that's the name of the song too. It's, the it's not really a ballad. It's a little, <laughs> uh, little less thrashy than the than the rest of their music. Yeah. Um, as I was saying to Tim and Matt before, I I. Never seen this in the wild and then saw it twice in the same week. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. This summer. So. I don't know a lot about Testament, but I know when people talk about, okay, here's the big the four. The big four, yeah. But who would, the, and someone had posted, well, who would you add as the big four? I've heard a lot four? of people say either Testament or Overkill. Yeah. Now, Testament, like you have to, in 1989, context is important. Metallica deserves a lot of credit for busting down doors of acceptance i mean master of puppets put them on the map it was a top 30 album but 1989 was um, and justice for all came out in 1988 but it wasn't until a few months later they put up their very first video with one bands like testament and and overkill and slayer and anthrax never would have been considered commercially viable if it weren't for metallica this right. one's actually on metallica's original label megaforce which at this point was distributed by atlantic was this the one that they cover no, they, on one of their albums, I know they cover Nobody's Fault by Aerosmith, oh. which is one of my favorite Aerosmith songs, and it makes sense, it's heavy, so it makes sense that a metal band can cover it. It's a very cool. Awesome. All right, so next up, I um, believe I'm the only one that owns this, is, uh, I mean, anybody knows me, and those are one of my all-time favorite bands. This is Rush, and the album that popped out in 1989 was Presto. This one's, uh, it's got the shrink wrap on it, but only the side of it's open. Um, is this one of my favorite Rush albums? No, but um, it's, uh, I have an affinity for this album for a couple of reasons. It was the first Rush studio album that I bought as a fan, new, coming out, because I got into the band sometime in 87. Hold Your Fire came out. I didn't get that for quite a few months later. Uh, I bought a show of hands when it first came out in early 89, but that was a live album. So this was the first new studio album. And this, this copy that I have here is, is uh, US, and that is significant because um, up until this album in the US Rush Run Mercury Records, 
This was the first one they did for Atlantic, even though they still had Anthem as their own kind of imprint. This has still got the hype sticker on it. Show Don't Tell is the best known song off this one. Um, also The Past, those were well, actually Superconductor. Those are the three songs that were videos on here. Uh, and I do like this album. It was, um, they were starting to get back to less synthesizers, more guitar, but it's a very trebly guitar sound. This was one of the two albums that was produced by Rupert Hine. I don't particularly like his production style. Um, it, they didn't toughen up the band very much, but I'm such a huge fan. I, I don't think, I think that even at their lowest, they, they didn't put out a bad album. It's just that uh, this isn't exactly, I wouldn't classify this as even progressive hard rock. I love, they went back to an old school Atlantic mm. label on this, which is another reason I'm glad I found the U.S. version of it. Um, another thing, I, a memory that I always have with this album, you guys remember a and Records and Tapes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the big record store in Canada was Sam the Record Man. But uh, I remember when I, where I grew up in Woodstock, a and Records and Tapes opened up sometime in 89. They were only open for a couple of years. But a and used to have a magazine called Music Express. Whenever you bought something, you'd get a free copy of Music Express. And Rush wasn't a band that I read about very often in Circus and Hit Prater, which I was buying religiously at the time, even though they covered them a lot in the 70s and in the early 80s. By the late 80s, they primarily shifted completely into covering basically all the bands that you've seen here so far, other than like the, the, the hard rock bands or the thrash bands. Okay. So bands like Rush, kind of, they'd get like in the back page mentioned. But Music Express, there was a lengthy article about Rush and specifically about this album. So I always think of that. I look back on this fondly. So that's that's the next one. Now we get some. Now we're gonna get a little heavy again. <laughs> <laughs> so this would be Wasp's fourth studio album, The Headless Children. This is my favorite Wasp um, studio album. Live in the Raw is my favorite Wasp album, but that's a live album. And this took me a long time to find. I'll tell you a quick story. I was on my way to uh, PEI, yeah. and my wife wanted to stop at Champlain Place in Moncton. And it was a Saturday morning, and I'd never been to Dex Dexter's Flea Market before. Oh, yeah. I'm never, I'm never in Moncton on the weekends. And so I said, oh, well, drop me off at Dexter's. You go to Champlain Place, yeah. come back and pick Bought me up. many an album at Dexter's. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was flipping through, and I wasn't finding anything really particularly interesting until my wife texted me and said, I'm, I'm, I'm ready, I'm out in the parking lot. So I had 10 or 12 albums left in the cart in the crate that I was going through, <laughs> trying to get one foot out the door, and boom, there, there was, there was wow. and I had been looking for that album wow. for, for quite a while. So who's, uh, on, who's in the back of This is uh, Chris Holmes and, and Johnny Rod. By this point, the drummer, uh, Steve, Riley. Steve Riley, I believe, was out of the band. And he's joined the band that we're going to talk about, I think. Coming uh, right up. Frankie Benelli from Quiet Riot actually did this tour, oh, I think. Okay. Yes, he's listed as the drums and percussion, Frankie yeah. Benelli. Probably they'd had all the artwork and the photos taken at this time. Yeah. So is that considered, like, what is the genre, would you say, for that record? I would say it's hard rock. Um doesn't really fall into the and I'm like Tim I don't like the hair metal uh, term. tag yes. the term it's it's to me it's all hard rock music um, it, it's more commercial commercially viable than some of their earlier this stuff. had forever free forever which was free the, which was a ballad it was a ballad. I've never seen the yeah. video of that they also cover uh, the real me by the who that's right and I think I seem to recall that there's a um, does this not have one of the guys from Uriah Heep playing uh, Ken Hensley, keyboards. Oh, wow. Yeah, so uh, uh, actually Matt's neighbor, Glenn, we, we went through his house. Huge, huge Uriah Heap fan. I'm surprised he doesn't have that record just because Ken Hensley. Yeah, right. I have to ask him about it. So next next up is uh, two, uh, yeah, we all have this in some form or another. Andy's the only one that has this on vinyl. Nice. Debut from Mr. Big. I'll let uh, I'll let you guys talk about this one. I, I do love this album, but... Uh, so, Mr. Big, I, I was a band that I heard of before I heard anything from them. Like as I said earlier, I read Circus and Hit Prater all the time. And I read a lengthy article about this band because they were formed around bass player Billy Sheehan. Mm -hmm. Fantastic bass player. I mean, anybody knows bass, there's no introduction needed for Billy Sheehan. But he had just left David Lee Roth's band. He, he played on Eat Him and Smile. And he also played on Skyscraper, but he didn't like the direction Skyscraper was going in. So you can't really hear Billy on there as much as you can on Even Smile. So he wanted to form um, just a, a basic, bluesy, hard rock band. 
and they were kind of a minor super group. Uh, the singer was a guy named Eric Martin who'd been recording solo albums prior to that. Uh, fantastic bluesy singer, very much, it, it, not really um, the vocal style that was popular at the time. He was much more like Paul Rogers from Bad Company, had a lot of soul in his voice. Pat Torpy, who sadly since deceased, the drummer, had been uh, kind of a behind the scenes drummer. Most recently he'd done a tour with Robert Plant, he did the Now and Zen tour. And uh, guitarist extraordinaire Paul Gilbert, who was I think 19 wow. at the time, he was very, very young when he did this album. So. So I'd heard of them months before I actually heard them, and actually, this is, a, this is a fun memory. I remember about July or so of 89, I was at a department store in Maine called Ames, which was a very, I don't think it's around anymore, but it was like a Kmart type of thing. This is when cassette singles were starting to become oh, okay, popular. Yeah. And I remember that day I saw these little cassettes that wound all the way around, like it was a slip case instead of a case that opened up, and I bought two cassette singles. I bought Wingers Headed for a Heartbreak, and uh, Mr. Big's addicted to that rush. Oh. And uh, that was their debut single, loved the song. And I remember buying the album, um, about a month after that, I bought it on cassette. I have it on CD here now, I think as does Matt. And I remember being a little bit underwhelmed with it. And uh, it was kind of hard to put my finger on because song for song, it was good. It was very professionally well done. But I don't know, as, as a whole album, it just seemed like one that it didn't really have as many standout tracks as I was hoping it would. Now their second album, Lean Into It, which was, was the really big one, I think that album is probably their best from start all the way to the end. But uh, still a good album. One thing that is notable about this is that this was around the time that they were really, the record companies were really starting to push CDs. So there's a song that's on the cassette and the CD to the, of Mr. Big's first album that's not on the record and that is their cover of Humble Pie's 30 Days in the Hole. Uh, I don't know if it ended up being one of their B-sides, but I, I've never actually seen the inside of this on record. So I think he held it up. It's got your typical red-green Atlantic uh, label on that. For a while, do you know? uh, I've had this for a couple of years, yeah. yeah. Um, Other than that, it's the same. The CD's just got your standard uh, booklet. Yeah, it's the same uh, font, same, same printing font. So there you go. That's where, that's probably the, even though it's not easy to find, it's probably still the easiest Mr. Big record to find simply because it came out in 89. 89. So you mentioned uh, Steve a, Riley, yeah. A, a song yeah. that's on the CD but not on the album. This is oh, LA this Guns. Too, yeah. this, this also has one. This is their second album, Cocked and Loaded. And the CD has a song called I Want to Be Your Man, which is my favorite LA Guns track. But it's, it's not, not on the there. album. It's a bonus track on the CD. But it's not on the album. It would have been the uh, the final song on the CD. So this was the most successful L.A. Guns album. It had the Ballad of Jane, which was their their power ballad entry into the power ballad sweepstakes. Yeah. I think this was a gold record for them. I believe it was. Never enough. So another single. That was a great song. It's and, it's uh, uh, it's called it's, it's never, never enough, 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 but it's actually never enough. That's interesting. Yeah. So the hype stickers got uh, an extra word. Looks like you got a promotional stamp copy too. Yeah. Gold stamp promo. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And Steve Riley is yeah. the drummer in L.A. Guns, and he came from Wasp. Correct. So, I think this was, he didn't play on the first L.A. Guns album. I believe he made his uh, appearance with L.A. Guns on this album. Kind of cool inner sleeve okay. on that one. And I think Steve Riley plays in one of the versions of L.A. Guns nowadays. Which is <laughs> yeah, you can't a, keep track of it. Which is kind of a sad, yeah. So next one, um, I think I'm the only one that has this. Uh, one of my favorite, and they're not recent because we're talking about 30 years ago, but um, they didn't start in the 70s, let's put it that way, Dream <laughs> Theater. Uh, their first album came out in 1989. It's called When Dream and Day Unite. And I have, this, I have it on CD, but this is the cassette. I'll show you that. This is on uh, Mechanic MCA Records. I talked about this on the uh, top 10 80s debut albums. Um, you know, they were basically a modern take on the likes of Rush, although they were also influenced by Iron Maiden, Queensryche. This is the lone album that Charlie Dominici sings on after that. They got James Labrie. And they were a young band at this time. They had chops to spare. They were all, they all went to Berkeley. You know, they could play rings around each other. And um, even though they did better albums after that, this was a good start and it came on. And I don't have this on vinyl either. I need to find this on vinyl. So next up, I believe this is one of Matt's favorite bands. So uh, this is the first album that Faith No More did with Mike Patton. Yeah. And so I remember turning my TV on in 1989 
and I was really into the guys with the the, uh, the vocal range. Yeah. And, and this seemed to be like just from out of nowhere. Like I had, had yeah. no idea about this band. It's like holy cow, what is that? Instantly loved them just based yeah. on that song and that video. I think uh, I got my friend Chris into them too as well. Um, don't have this on vinyl, sadly. Hard to but, find uh, on vinyl. Yes, exactly. But they've been doing a, a reissue campaign. You've got the like the original CD, and I've got um, one of the bonus ones. They've been reissuing them all with like an extra an extra CD. So. This, of course, contained "Epic," which was a top five single, and really one of the first indications that there was a shift happening in music. Absolutely. And uh, but when they were heavy, they were really heavy. Yes. But they were very melodic too. They had keyboards and like you see, Mike Pat is an amazing singer, like amazing vocal range, and also he's a he's an odd guy. He's an interesting <laughs> guy. It's at, uh, they cover uh, Black Sabbath War Pigs on here, and um, there's quite a few. I think four or five singles. Yeah, falling to pieces. Video. Yeah, yeah. I saw these guys at Olympic Stadium with Guns N' Roses and Metallica oh, in 1992. Oh, wow, yeah. They were the only one to get through their entire oh, set. Oh, you were at that show? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That's crazy. It was pretty crazy. Gotta find that on vinyl. So, next up, another band that debuted in 1989. This is Dangerous Toys. This is one of my favorite albums. Uh, I'd consider this... Uh, they were like Junkyard. They were kind of... Uh, pushed into that hair metal category, although I, I refer to them as uh, cowboy metal. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. They're a Texas uh, hard rock band. Uh, Teasin' and Pleasin' and Scared were the uh, two singles so, that, that received their play. Scared, correct me if I'm wrong, is that not like an Alice Cooper tribute? Don't it is. Isn't there are lots of, like, I know there's a line about oh, Lace and Whiskey okay. in it. And they, they wrote, they, they said they wrote the song inspired by Alice Cooper, which yeah. obviously was one of their, their favorite artists. And uh, this is a gold stamp promo copy. I picked this up early on in my vinyl collecting days from Marty down at Livewire. Okay. I don't yeah. think he knew what he had because it. Uh, no. he, uh, he gave it to me for a song. So I was really happy to find it. Shout out, out to Marty. Hey, Marty's a great dude. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, the clown on the front. Is that kind of like a mascot for you? Yeah. It, which that, that was kind of the end of that era. Because, it, I mean, obviously, Myron Maiden had Eddie and... I know Extreme had their little Francis guy, but uh, <laughs> bands in the '90s didn't have mascots, did they? No. And then, then Megadeth had what Vic Rattlehead, yeah. and yeah, he he appears on their second album, Hellacious okay. Acres. Um, not as prominent, but he is he's on there, and uh, I I really like their second album too. They kind of after that they they released a few more albums, but this one from front to back, I I love every song on here. Awesome. So next up is um, the only album that I have in two formats to show you, but. I'll let Andy start it off because he's actually got an, uh, an unopened copy. This is uh, White Snake. Slip, Slip of the, of the tongue. tongue. This is also a, I just realized, a stamp. You have a lot of stamp promos. A lot of stamp promos. <laughs> I don't really, uh, it doesn't matter one way or another. It's, uh, But I do seem to have quite a few of them, especially <laughs> in 89. Yeah. This, what you got there, is a, you got to read this small print. Yeah, that's a Canadian version. They, there's not a lot of difference in them. Now, um... This was the follow-up to the 1987 album, the big one for them, and I know I'm probably going to raise some eyebrows with this, but I actually prefer this album to the 1987 album. Now, um, I love the 1987 album. I mean, it's still the night and, and um, you know, Crying in the Rain and Bad Boys, but I'm not huge on the production on that album. I think it's kind of... And, and, and maybe it's the fact that I've heard Here I Go Again so many times I need to never hear it again, but... I really like, uh, I think the production on this is crisp. I think Tommy Aldridge's drums are masterfully recorded. Um, Keith Olsen worked on this album, who also worked on the 1987 album along with uh, uh, Mike Stone. But Mike Klink was the co-producer oh, on okay. this album. He's worked with GNR. And... Yeah, yeah, probably best known for, for GNR. Now, the copy I have is just like uh, Andy's, except um, it's a U.S. copy. And also, I picked this up unopened in Portland probably about 20 years ago, and this is the hype sticker on it. They, um, they struck gold when they redid uh, Here I Go Again in 1987, obviously. They also redid Crying in the Rain. Both of those were older White Snake songs. They tried to have Lightning Strike again when they redid Fool for Your Loving, which is originally from 1980. I still like the original version better. Of course, the notable thing about this album is that this is also the album that Steve Vai plays guitar on. Um, and like the last album, this has Hugh Syme artwork. I think it's kind of easy to see. They're continuing along with that theme. I don't know if this is supposed to be a tongue, but it's like a banner with a 
a stamp or something like that. But the other thing I got to show you is something that just came out not too long ago, which is the 30th anniversary version of Slip of the Tongue. Now, you can name your price on how much you want to spend on these things. This is just your standard, um, it's actually a two disc version. I was pleasantly surprised to see this at sunrise. I mainly bought this for um, the second disc, which says Monitor Mixes April 1989. Now, I'm pretty sure that this was recorded before Steve I got on board, because even though there's no lead guitar on these songs, on these this disc two, Steve I is such a, a distinctive guitar player, even when he's playing rhythm, you can tell it's him. I, so I don't know if it's actually Adrian Vandenberg. It might have been a guy named Kevin Russell from 707. I don't know. But I think it's Adrian because when I saw this song title, this made the difference between me having it in my hand to me walking up to the counter and paying for it. Um, I'm an enormous fan of Adrian Vandenberg's band Vandenberg. They only did three records uh, in 82, 83, 85. I love them all. They had a top 40 single with a ballad, Burning Heart. Might be my favorite ballad of all time. Definitely my favorite guitar solo of all time. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading in, again, Circus and Hip Parader, that they were re-recording Burning Heart for this album. I always wanted to hear Coverdale sing it. This is the closest you're going to get, and unfortunately, it's not complete. He kind of bluffs his way through the first verse from one chorus. Then he leaves. He mumbles something about what <laughs> key is this in, and the rest of the band finishes. So no lead guitar, just rhythm guitar, bass, drums, and keyboards. And the other thing I like about this, it's got all the songs that actually appear on the album proper, but there's no background vocals. It's very stark. Oh, okay. um, there's some, you know, there's, there's a track on here called uh, Kill for the Cut, and in brackets it says, In Desperate Search of a Melody. It could have, they could have made a really cool song out of this. I don't know why they didn't go further with it, but. So this is also, there's also some cool stuff. This, I remember having this on my wall. Uh, the actual full-page advertisement for the album. I had this was in the back of one of the magazines and I had it on my wall This ad is a poster for the Donington concert, which Matt and I have talked about and That's the single cover to the deeper the love which was the biggest single off of this. It really didn't have uh, a big single like here I go again or is this love but I really like the album I don't always get these bonus versions of albums. I've already bought but um, this one to me was worth the bucks Nice. Now we're going to talk about an album that both Andy and I have. I don't think Tim's a huge fan, but uh, I feel like I should be. I've listened to it. I, I just nothing, nothing, uh, nothing takes hold. So, so I'll let you guys take the this. debut album from Badlands. Uh, we're talking about so after uh, Jake left Ozzy. Yeah, Jakey uh, Lee, Jake guitar Lee. player. Yeah, this is a super group of sorts. Yeah, so you've got Eric Singer on drums. You've yeah, heard of him. Who's the singer? Ray Gillen, Ray who, was, who passed away, he died of AIDS in like 93. Yeah. And uh, and the bass, let me see if I'm right about this. Where's the, where's the list? Greg Chason. Is the Greg Chason. Okay. Now here's a little bit of trivia. Greg Chason, bass player. His brother, Kenny Chason, was the bass player in the band Keel. Oh, okay. So a family of bass players. <laughs> and as far as I know, he's still... Um, when um, Jakey Lee formed the Red Dragon Cartel, he's still kind of involved with that. Okay. okay. Yeah. I think most of you probably know what Eric Singer's done since then. Yeah, so this is, again, like, you know, you lent them in with the hair metal stuff, but it's really more of like that kind of... Bluesy. Uh, bluesy yeah. rock. Again, it sounds like something I should like, and I've listened to the... I remember listening to this album in its entirety and just... Kind of shrugging my shoulders. Like, it's something I'm not hearing that other people are hearing. <laughs> Another uh, gold stamp promo. This, I, I mentioned yes. finding that Wasp album on the way to PEI. Mm -hmm. Also, this had a chunk. Yep, it's got a... Uh, We've got some hype stickers on there, too. Yeah. Found this in Charlottetown at Back Alley Music. Awesome. I was just about ready to leave empty-handed and uh, found this and the, the debut by XYZ oh, in the okay. same bin. Oh, that's so a was, great... That, you, know, I for, you know what? I forgot about that. That's a great record, too. That made, <laughs> that made my top 30. Yeah. That I, uh, Tony Harnell? That I, no, that was TNT. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, XYZ was um, Terry Luce, who went on to Great oh, White, yes, and, and Don Dawkins produced them. Yeah, no, that's a great record. All right, so next up, we're going to get a little classic here. Um, a band I wasn't into in 89, although I did like the song they had out. Um, a band that would become one of my favorite bands in just three short years, Queen the Miracle. This was um, the second to last album they did while Freddie Mercury was alive. This version I have is a, a 
American version on Capitol Records. Matt's actually got a pretty rare um, version of it on CD, which is this on is Capitol. This is actually the first uh, Queen record I ever bought. The um, in 1991, <laughs> on Hollywood so. Records reissued the entire Queen catalog. So it's hard to find Queen CDs on anything but Hollywood Records. So yeah, Matt's got a keeper there. Um, like I said, the single off the first single off this was "I Want It All," which is still, yeah, it's my favorite Queen song. Let's face it. I almost bought the cassette single to it. I loved it so much, but I didn't think I could get into. I wasn't ready to get into a band that varied at that point because when I thought of Queen at that point, I still thought another one bites the dust. Like, really, how wasn't did, really what I was into. How did that album do for them? I think it went gold, um, and in the years since, I think all of their albums have been recertified. It, of course, like all of their albums from like '86 on, they did it did very well worldwide. But um, this was also the first album that there was no tour to support it because by this time Freddie was was too well. So I'll show you the inner sleeve of this, a photo of the band. They did their very best, really, even at this point, to hide the fact that Freddie was very, very thin. Yeah. Uh, here's all the lyrics on this. And actually, that CD contains a song that's not on here, the song called um, Hang On In There. And then there's a little oh. instrumental called Chinese Torture. They were B-sides, yeah. but they weren't, they weren't on the actual record. And um, it's got kind of a customized uh, label on it. Just looks like that. And yeah. Miracle. Now, uh, and then here's one we all have in some form or another. Uh, so 1989, Kiss. Yeah. So after a few years of uh, fumbling through the forest, <laughs> <laughs> uh, following trends. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is a, a, a weird period for Kiss where they're just sort of looking like uh, here's our street clothes, here's our denim. Uh, shirts and they, there's not really any um, edge to them or any kind of when you I mean I remember us talking about this years ago Matt you compare this photo to the photo on the cover of Revenge and they don't even look like the same mm -hmm. band and it has nothing to do with having a different drummer of course this was Eric Carr's last album yeah. this album came out in uh, like October of 89 I mentioned Ace Frehley's Trouble Walk and the lead single off of this was Hide Your Heart which um, you know let's face it, was more suited to Paul Stanley's vocal range than, than Ace's vocal range, or Danny Joe Brown from Molly Hatchet, or Bonnie Tyler, or Robin <laughs> Beck, or the multitude of people that also recorded the song. It was crazy. Is it a good song? Yeah. Did it need that many versions? I don't think so. So, <laughs> the, the story behind this album, a lot of KISS fans have known that they, they say that most of these songs were essentially demos, demos yeah. and then they just kind of built upon the demos. Which... A few of them I don't even think has actually, uh, I don't think has real drums on it. Mm -hmm. And and some of them, and not definitely none of them have Eric Carr on them. I think uh, Kevin Valentine plays on some of the drum tracks, as he also did for Psycho Circus. Nice Eric Singer stuff. remembers playing on some of the demos, but he doesn't think any of those made the album. It's an interesting time, like you said. So. In early 1989, and if anybody's read Paul Stanley's book, Face the Music, um, Paul was really disenfranchised with Kiss at this point. Basically, he said, I'm taking control of this band. If you see the video for, you know, from the previous year, Let's Put the X in Sex, he's out front, he doesn't even have a guitar. It's like, this is, I'm the front man of this band. Gene was completely in the background. Yeah. Started to come around with this, but Paul Stanley went on a solo tour in 89, and Eric Singer was the drummer, which angered Eric Carr to no end, and... His guitar player was a guy that we've been hearing about an awful lot lately, Bob Kulik, but that's another story. So this album, I think, um, no, I know, whenever an album comes out that's got, I, in my opinion, too many songs on it, I call it Hot in the Shade Syndrome. This was really Kiss's first album to come out in the CD era. Now that's cool. I wish I'd have brought my CD, because my CD is blue where yours is silver. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, it's got 15 songs. songs. I think they could have whittled this down to a 10-song album and it would have been really good. This gave them their first top 10 single since Beth uh, in, in the song Forever. <laughs> it was a ballad that Paul Stanley wrote with Michael Bolton. Um, love the song. Love Bruce Kulick's acoustic guitar solo in it and the video was really cool. Just a black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, 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 it got them back on the charts. And I really love the fact that this lineup one of their most musically adept had a legitimate hit single. People talk about Lick It Up and Heaven's on Fire. A lot of people know those songs. They weren't hits. Mm -hmm. Forever was a hit, a bona fide hit. Unfortunately, it didn't take this album up to platinum status with it, although uh, there was a successful tour that, uh, oh, yeah. came, uh, that almost, almost came, came to New Brunswick. Uh, it was one of the few times that Paul Stanley actually missed a performance. He broke his ribs 
during a show, didn't even realize it until after the show was done. And one of the shows that got canceled was a show at Moncton, Moncton at the Coliseum yeah. with Slaughter and Winger, which would have been a good show. That and I think fantastic. Yeah. So that that was there was the triple bill. I don't think Winger played all the shows. I think Faster Pussycat was on some of the gigs, oh, but I think okay. Slaughter was on all of the gigs, which is funny in and of itself because Slaughter was formed out of the ashes of the Vinnie Vincent invasion. <laughs> we could go down the Kiss rabbit hole here, but yeah. yeah. Um, Hot in the Shade has enough good songs on it to qualify for, for this list, I think. Yeah, and I was a fan, oh, sorry, Andy. Oh, go ahead. I was a huge Kiss fan at the time, and again, they were still trying to find their way. They eventually found it with Revenge, but I remember seeing the uh, video to rise to it. And although the beginning and end of it kind of confused me a little bit. They were in makeup. I couldn't on the makeup and stuff, but I, I really liked the kind of performance video. Jean's makeup where, did not look right. Paul's looked okay. Jean's looked funny. Yeah, they yeah. were wearing two different kind of costume, mm. inner costumes, but... Uh, you can hear Bruce going, you're on, guys! <laughs> I started, started really getting excited with the band again. I, I had tickets to that show in Moncton, and I was more disappointed that I wasn't going to see Slaughter, because I was really uh, into Slaughter, yeah. and was super excited to see the those guys and uh, I was eating my breakfast that morning of the show and heard on the radio that it had been cancelled because of the ribs I believe that was in Cape Breton that it happened um, Wow and they never made it to Moncton and, oh, man. and they never made it back so yeah disappointing I would have loved like at that point you know going see I didn't get into Kiss till 93 but I love Winger I would have loved to have seen them in concert too and, and uh, if we were doing a best of 88 episode the, the first Winger <laughs> would <laughs> definitely be there Right All right, so next up, another band that's actually open for KISS at one time or another. Band I've been trying to get Tim into for years now. He's about halfway there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is great. We all, have, we all have this. Ellipsis twice shy. <laughs> dot, 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 twice shy. Yeah. So the, the previous one was Once, Once Bitten. Bitten so. so that's a song by... Ian Hunter, Ian which Hunter. if you've seen our episode on Down and Outs, uh, Joel Eats Down and Outs, Matt and I talk about Ian Hunter, Moth the Hoople. Yeah. I it guess. was out of nowhere. It gave him this huge top five single, and I absolutely hated it. Oh. I can't really tell you why. I like it now, yeah. but I don't know. It was different. Yeah, it had Bobby Brown in the video, and I believe that's one of up here. Oh, it yeah, one of yeah, yeah. Now that's interesting. It doesn't have the photo that's on the back of the CD with the two girls on it. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. But I, I got to say this, too. They did this with Once Bit. I hate how the song titles are written. It's just about impossible to read. Um, there is a deluxe version of this mm -hmm. with a lot more songs. Um, okay. I know that um, there's, a, there's a track on it. It's an awful sounding title, but it's not as bad as the... There's a track called Bitches and Other Women. Well, what it is is they cover the song Bitch by the Rolling Stones and a couple others. One of them, I, which took me by surprise because nobody covers Foreigner. But they covered their song "Women" from the Head Games album, okay. so it's like a medley. Yeah, right. Unfortunate title, but yeah. Um, so "What's Been Twice Shy" was a big hit. The Angel song was a top forty hit. The ballad off of this, and "House of Broken Love" was another uh, song that got a lot of. I think it was a single. It starts off with like a two minute guitar. Song yeah, and um, it's not customized other than the fact it's got the logo on it, but it's got the purple Capitol Records logo that they were using at the time. Um, yeah, I like a lot of the early Great White. Uh, stuff. And it's got a shark on it. It's got the Stravinsky brothers, which was like, their management or something like that. Um, Alan Niven, of course, was their manager. He also managed Guns N' Roses, Roses, and there were no drugs involved at all, I'm sure. <laughs> so there you go. So after Great White. Oh, yeah. I don't think Matt's big into this band, but um, I'll let Andy start off. This is uh, Blue Murder. Yeah. 1989, of course. Another debut album. Unfortunately, this wasn't a band of the lengthy discography. No. They only did two official albums. Um, I know a friend of mine had this on cassette. Uh, who's a, the drummer? Is Carmine a piece who's right. played with everybody from Vanilla Fudge to Rod Stewart to Ozzy. He's a. I don't think he played on the album, but you can see him in the Bark at the Moon video. Okay. Yeah. His brother Vinny, of course, is another famous drummer. Was in Black Sabbath and uh, Dio. And you guys like this because of the John Sykes well, connection? Well, like Mr. Big, actually very similar to Mr. Big, I read about this band before they came out because, yeah, John Sykes was a guitar player in White Snake who played on uh, the reissue of Slide It In, the 1987 album, co-wrote the entire 1987 album with the exception of the two re-records, Crying in the Rain and Here I Go Again. And so he retained his record deal with Geffen after Coverdale fired the entire band. 
Um, and he put this uh, this trio together with, so like we said, Carmen a piece. The bass player, Tony Franklin, plays a fretless bass, has a very unique sound. He had played in The Firm, which was a short-lived supergroup formed by Jimmy Page and um, Paul Rogers, the Bad Company. And actually, the drummer, Chris Slade, went on to ACDC. He's the bald drummer you see on the Razor's Edge era. So this album came out, um, I remember seeing the video on the power of Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Kings. and was just blown away by it. it oh. This was one, I believe, one of the very first albums produced by Bob Rock after Bob Rock left, uh, like wasn't the engineer for Bruce Fairburn anymore. It was either this or, or another album we're going to be talking about. Uh, both came out in 89. This is an incredible sounding album. The drums sound huge on this, but it's very much in the vein of that 1987 White Snake album. And John Sykes, as it turns out, is a really, really good singer. Now, I want to get Andy's opinion on this. Um, I think what this album was lacking was a single. And to me, Jelly Roll was not it. That was the song that they were pushing to be a single. Yeah. That was not it. Um, there's a lot of lengthy songs in here, almost um, like Ptolemy and, and uh, The Valley of the Kings, very mystical, Eastern sounding. Oh, Valley of the Kings is almost like a cashmere type Seven song. minutes long. Yeah. yeah. Now, what is really funny, and I never noticed this till later, but the two things. First song, Riot, he was in Thin Lizzy as well. John Sykes was also in Thin Lizzy. It's essentially a rewrite lyrically of Jailbreak by Thin Lizzy, <laughs> if you know that song. And John Sykes can sound a lot like Phil Lynott, even though he's a better singer, but he can sound a lot like Phil in his phrase, vocal phrasing. But the second song, Sex Child, is totally a jab at David Coverdale. It even has a breakdown in the middle, like Still of the Night, which he co-wrote, but it's just a little, because it, it, I don't think, they, they never mended fences. Um, there's a ballad on here called Out of Love that might have done as a second or third single, but I, it just didn't have that top ten pop, popish anthem that radio would have embraced, but it's a fantastic S album. Super album. I want to get yeah. into that one. Um, Give it a listen, I think you'll yeah, like it. Yeah. This And actually this one, I have, is a stamped copy. <laughs> And uh, yours is Canadian, mine's is American, but other than that, you, you can't really tell them. You've got the hype sticker. The hype sticker, too, yeah. And they also had a song called Blue Murder, so, yeah, That's great record. Nice. I've recently listened to it, and I think it holds up really well. Next up. Got another debut album here for you. This one came out January of 19. Really early in the year, yeah. And this is the debut album from... Warren. He's got himself a picture disc. Yes, yeah, dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, picked this up at a local shop. Oh, that's um, the Heaven single. Yeah. Okay. I've actually got the, uh, might as well pull up the record too. You had mentioned cassette singles. I was in Hampton Beach in 19, summer of 1989. Okay. And bought, uh, Heaven? Heaven on cassette single as well as Down Boys. Oh, cool. And I love the B-sides of those cassette singles. So I was like, I, I need to get this uh, entire album. Now, were they album tracks or were they were they actual B-sides? It was uh, Cold Sweat and um, ba -ba -ba -ba, In the Sticks. Okay. So they were album tracks. They weren't anything that weren't on the album. But I just thought, if these are the deeper tracks on this album, I've got to get the whole thing and it's now this is you know like great white this is a band i've come to appreciate over the years but i really didn't like them at all when they were current which is so weird i don't know why but um i remember thinking that they did the in the down boys video which i think is a fantastic song now but they did the choreography and i thought that was the dumbest looking thing i'd ever seen i don't know i don't know i took it from the um kiss right there which is probably why yeah. i didn't like it at the time i yeah. who knows i discovered these guys through a TV show. There was a show called Roller Games, and so it was. It <laughs> was, it was such, I'm trying to think of, um, like, you know how you have American Ninja Warrior and that sort of oh, thing okay. on TV now. So this was Roller Games. So they these like uh, actual groups of rollerbladers would go around a track and beat the crap out of each other and stuff. In between that, they would have bands come on. Oh, okay. And play. I heard Warren to Down Boys, I think, and I'm pretty sure they did Heaven. Mm -hmm. um, but it made sense. First I instantly two hooked on that band. So. I remember the show, but I don't yeah. remember. Uh, yeah, check it out. You can actually find you know, a clip of it on YouTube. Are there? Did you actually count? Are there actually 32 pennies in the back uh, of this record? <laughs> That's a good question. I've never counted them, but I'm guessing yeah. there are. Yeah. yeah, that would make sense. So, okay, next up, this is a big album for Matt and for Andy, for sure. Just recently saw them in concert. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah so. Another Bob Rock produced album. Yeah, yeah so it was either this one or the Blue Murder record uh, were the first ones that Bob, I think, that Bob Rock produced on his own as, as sole producer. Okay. Yeah, the Cult Sonic Temple, 
um, I saw them. This was my very first concert here in Fredericton, uh, December 1989. With Bonham, with who we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, I just love everything about this record. So the previous record was essentially like uh, uh, the producer Rick Rubin wanted them to sound like uh, ACDC. ACDC. Yeah. Uh, this one is definitely more leaning into the hard rock. Yeah, because the Cult have a, a an interesting lineage as far as sound, because they were four years previous to that. It was like She Sell Sanctuary, which was yeah. alt rock, alt -rock. Yeah. and by this time and... they were full on, you know, ready to compete with the likes of Guns N' Roses and uh, who opened for them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's the album of Vertigo. Yeah, it's interesting. That's another one that's kind of interesting where these decisions get made. If you were to have bought this in the states, they were on Warner Brothers. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Next up's a band that uh, Andy and I weigh into, and uh, we just saw earlier this year opening for Def Leppard. This is Tesla, their second album, The Great Radio Controversy, which uh, got its name from an actual court case. Um, they were named after, of course, Nikola Tesla, one of the credited as being one of the inventors of radio, and uh, apparently a lot of the things that uh, Thomas Edison was given credit for Tesla had actually done first, so odd odd choice for a, a group to name themselves after. But and like a lot of the other bands, they they got lumped in with the hair bands. Which a hair band is such a dumb. If they didn't have hair, they'd all look like the singer from Midnight Oil. But anyway, um, yeah. So Tesla, yeah, their first album on Geffen Records. Not the easiest thing to find. It's not easy to find Tesla records. And um, yeah, so Andy's sleeve is in much better shape than mine. Mine's a little bit. <laughs> So the record itself is your standard black uh, Geffen uh, label. Love Song was a ballad off of this, which was uh, a top ten single for them. One of two songs that they're known for, that one and their cover of Signs. Um, no lyrics inside this, which is interesting because most, most bands did print their lyrics. The other notable thing that I always point out on this album, and if anybody his nose is on top of it, like, oh, here he goes again. Um, if you look at Troy Lakeda's shirt, he's wearing a Yesterday and Today shirt, aka YT. So that's one, they're one of the first major bands that I ever saw that acknowledged YT when I got into the early the YNT? YNT? I was into Tesla first, but a year yeah. later, and I remember I was looking at that and I figured out what it said because yeah. I'd never even seen the logo before at that point because I couldn't find the first two records. But a uh, great band, and um, four out of fifth, four out of five guys in the band still together. Tommy Skio's not with them anymore, but they got Dave Rude. But other than that, they're uh, they're still out there. They're doing their own shows, but they're also opening, uh, as we said, opening for Def Leppard and uh, the like. Which uh, the very first thank you they they give on here in the credits is Def Leppard, and that goes back to them opening for them on the Hysteria tour. Next up, another debut album. This was a great year for debut albums. So this is number. Five. Yeah, we're getting into number five. five. Yeah, so we're getting into band. Now, now we're getting into ones I think from here on in that we all have in some form or another. And uh, this one I only just recently found on vinyl at the Record Expo. It's the first Extreme album, 1989, on AM Records. And um, even though, you know, here's the thing about the first Extreme record. About the only one hang up I have is with the lyrics. The lyrics are a little. <laughs> Yeah. Cheesecake? A little cheesecake. A little bit of cheesecake. I mean, you know, they're smarter guys than than but than uh, the lyrics might, you know. It, it's interesting because, I mean, uh, they go from uh, teacher's pet, uh, little girls, you know, you can pr probably figure out the lyrics. Then they have Watching Waiting, which is about the crucifixion of Jesus. And, it's, and, then, and then followed by Mother, Don't Want to Go to School Today. And then... <laughs> And Real in depth, uh, deep you lyrics. Know what I just realized just now is that "Play with Me" isn't on this record. It's oh, only on the okay. cassette and the CD. Because right. I was just about to say "Play with Me" yeah. is on the soundtrack of um, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and it sounds like it. But musically, they were amazing right from the get go. Uh, Nuno Bettencourt, amazing on guitar and smart arrangements, and Gary Sharon, one of my favorite singers. Um, Another band, they kind of just came out a little too yeah. late for their style. Yeah. If this had come out in 86, might have been a difference. They might have been able to sustain. And um, the other thing is interesting, of course, if you know anything about Extreme, they're huge Queen fans. This album is actually produced by Mac, well, Reinhard Mac, but Mac produced Queen's albums through most of the 80s. He also produced Billy Squire, very distinctive production style. My record looks just like Andy's, got the A&M, that's what the A&M logo you 
Not a lot of bands on AM that I was into. YNT is an exception. But, uh, Super jealous guy. Gonna find that one. In the last few years, somehow I've ended up with the first three Extreme Records all on vinyl, <laughs> which was very, very tough. Another thing I like, and I meant to say this when I was talking about my sort of preamble 1989, it was also a time where people welcomed comebacks. It wasn't like, oh, look at this old person trying to, you know, make an amount of comeback. We've got one coming right up and one after that that's a huge example of a band that just that came, that was big in the 70s, went into practically oblivion and then came back bigger than ever. And it wasn't just limited to hard rock. There was acceptance for it. I mean, if you think about how big Cher was in the late 80s, reinvented herself as, you know, got in with Desmond Child and the Bon Jovi Sambora thing. Um, even... Uh, even the B-52s, a band that had been around for almost 10 years, had one of their biggest hits. So that doesn't happen anymore either. So here we go. One of the biggest examples of a comeback that I don't think anybody could have seen coming. Coming in at number four. Yeah. Our list. Alice Cooper. You're all trash. Everybody's got a vinyl. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. Yeah, this it's was Alice's similar. first album on Epic. I don't know why they printed it so big. Um, and uh, Desmond Child, I mentioned, songwriter to the stars. He, uh, he helped Bon Jovi, he helped Joan Jett, he helped Aerosmith, and uh, Alice Cooper was quoted as saying, every time I turned on the radio, the songs that I turned up louder were songs like You Give Love a Bad Name, I Hate Myself for Loving You, Dude Looks Like a Lady, and what they all had in common was that they were recorded by Desmond Child. So not only did he enlist Desmond Child as a co-writer, he also produced this album mm -hmm. and gave him one of his biggest career hits with Poison. One of my favorite songs by anybody. He will always have that in concert, pretty much. Always. always. Tied with Schools Out as a number seven hit, as, as his biggest song. Um, I mean, a lot of longtime Alice fans sneer upon this album. I actually think Hey Stupid is a superior album, but that's another story for another time. Um, but this did its trick in bringing him back to the masses. I know a lot of people got into this album at the time. It took me a few more years to get into Alice. And another Fredericton analogy is that Alice played in Fredericton on this tour with Great White opening supporting Twice Shy, which I would have thought would have, that would have been a great Fantastic. double bill to yeah, say. I was, I was at that show, it was my first, I had been to concerts with my parents at the Aiken Center, but that was my first rock wow. show. Wow. Oh man. Wow. It, was, it was great. Now, do any of you, yeah, yeah, mine, mine just came in a plane, no, no, maybe. Yeah. I, get, I gotta think, it must have, because the CD oh, has, and the CD and cassette, had, there, maybe there was just a lyric sheet. Yeah. Because, well, yeah, that's... So here we go, good stuff. Now, um, a bigger, I mean, Alice, that was a big comeback. The bigger one had already kind of begun. Um, Aerosmith, of course, were big in the 70s, crashed and burned in the early 80s, started to come back with Done With Mirrors as far as a new record deal. Got a new lease on life from Run DMC, redoing Walk This Way. Then comes Permanent Vacation, which was Bruce Fairburn, Bob Rock, Vancouver, that was this, you know, continuing the Bon Jovi tradition, bands coming to Vancouver and doing a big album. So at this point, they followed it up with a superior album. Our number three yeah. record. Pump, we all have on vinyl. This, I think, is my favorite Aerosmith album. I was kind of expecting this to be number two. Yeah, it's interesting how they, uh, but uh, although the number two album was recorded at the same time, yeah. the same place, and there are connections. Um, this is an amazing, amazing piece of work, and I think that this brought some fans that, from the longtime fans that maybe thought Permanent Vacation was a little poppy, back because it's a little tougher sounding. It's sleazy. The, the Steven Tyler's lyrics are among his filthiest, therefore best. Um, the album sounds great. It's got a, it, this Bob Rock. By this time, Bob Rock was a producer, so he had Mike Fraser who we worked with on a lot of albums after mm -hmm. that I think who also went on to become I've got a making of thing there yeah too. the making yeah. of pump very interesting look inside the, the, the dynamic there are a little inter if you have the CD the CD actually lists more tracks but there aren't more tracks it's just that there are little interludes okay. yeah. so it'll be like 5.1 or uh, mm -hmm. you know different things like that but the band were you know probably the healthiest, like they they completely cleaned up at this point, and this album of the 10 songs on it, four of them were top 40 singles, three of them were top 10 singles. So they had huge singles, Love in an Elevator, Janie's got, got a Gun, What It Takes, The Other Side, 
big videos. This was a big tour. I would have loved to have seen because of who they had opening for them. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. And uh, typical funny Aerosmith, yeah, artwork. And surprisingly, though Print Vacation was successful, they didn't get a oh. customized label. Tattooed by Mark Ryden, again, that same... Uh, the the same Danger Danger. Yeah. Interesting. Even the non-singles that you mentioned. Oh, like it's strong. F-I-N-E, yeah. Fine, and a Monkey on My Monkey Back. On my back. Those yeah. two, I love those two songs. Yeah. They, uh, yeah, it was a strong album from start to finish. And maybe the last Aerosmith album that I liked every single song on, even though I've liked a lot of what they did since then. So, all right, number two is one I don't have on vinyl. We both managed to find uh, awesome original copies. And even though they'd only been, this is only their fifth album, this was a comeback album for Motley Crue, definitely, Dr. Feelgood. Recorded in Vancouver at the same time Aerosmith were recording Pump. Uh, this one was produced by Bob Rock. It's got the huge production sound in it. I think it was this album or Sonic Temple that, that led, uh, maybe both, that led Metallica to using Bob Rock for the Black Album. This was Motley Crue's most successful album. Um, the title song was a huge song for them, Kickstart My Heart, Without You, Don't Go Away. One of my favorite Motley Crue songs, Don't Go Away, Man, Just Go Away. <laughs> they were relatively healthy at this point. Um, uh, Bob Rock wrote up the best of them. I think it's some of their best, sort of definitely some of their best songs. Again, I mentioned the connection with Aerosmith. Uh, what is it, Slice Your Pie? You can clearly hear Steven Tyler singing on it. Absolutely. And, uh, I believe this came out in the fall of 89. It did. I distinctly remember hearing the premiere of this on a radio show called Metal Shop. And they played most of the album. They talked to Vince and Tommy. And it was, you just, I think you were rooting for them. Because they'd come out of a, like, Mickey died. Yeah. And brought, brought back to life. And, you know, you were, you were kind of rooting for them. And, and they, they did. They, came, they ended off the 80s with a bang. With a, with a great, with a great collection of songs. And, uh. We have a few CD versions too. Yeah, uh... this one is. I got this. This came out in '99. This was when they they had first um, got the rights to their uh, material away from Electra, so they put their the, the Crucial Crew remasters. Uh, this is just a Columbia's copy that I picked up. It's got a few bonus songs on it, but nothing essential. I mean, the album is really good the way it is. I just thought of something else that was funny. Um, I think Matt may or may not remember this, but. Um, also, I love the artwork. And who did this artwork? Mine on the back. It talks about Crew Fest 2. You've got Theory of a Dead Man, Drowning Pool, and Charm City Devils opening for them. Who were, who were uh, Charm City Devils? Devils? Not familiar with that band. Uh, let's see. Who did the art? From Kevin Brady. Kevin Brady. I don't know that. Uh, I'll tell you, it looks darn good on vinyl. But... 20th anniversary edition. That's Matt like might remember we when we were going to NDCC, there was the, at the time there was a pool hall in Woodstock that we okay. met that had a jukebox. Yeah. And somebody went in and I know they were trying to play Dr. Feelgood off of this C D, but they kept hitting track one, which is Terror in Tinseltown, which is forty two <laughs> seconds of like a little intro. Yeah. And you'd hear them get madder and madder and we're over there going <laughs> <laughs> not very nice. Anyway, uh, so yeah, that was our number two. And number one, I, I knew when we started to talk about doing this that we would all have the same record. And here it is. The debut album from Skid Row. Um, number one album. Uh, so this one, just so you know, I ranked them um, by points. So the top record would get 20 points. This one hit 20 for all three of us. Yeah. 60 points. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know and deservedly so it's a fantastic record now i think the versions that you guys have are the same they're they're like uk versions uk version you yeah. uh mine's actually I, I managed to find i found this at backstreet records in 1997 it's a canadian issue okay. uh, on atlantic and um tim got this for me yeah but what a what a great record um and i have such good memories of getting this um i remember in early 89 youth gone wild came out Heard that song, saw the video, said, yeah, that's kind of cool. Wasn't enough. But when 18 and Life came out, I'm like, that's awesome. I got to have this. And I remember you couldn't get it all the time. Like they were, it's like they were having a hard time keeping up with uh -huh. the demand. I finally, I got the cassette. And I played that cassette I don't know how many times. Like I know it inside out. And what I really liked, I was trying to think about, you know, what really took hold of me with this band is that when you read, when you would read interviews with them, 
Oh, and actually, I should back up a little bit. This is another band that I knew about before they came out. I knew about them in 1987 because, because, of, the... of, because of Bon Jovi. I was like, Bon Jovi was a band that opened up. Now I want to start buying albums. Now I want to start reading about bands like this. And I remember John talking about this band that he was working with called Skid Row because he and Snake Sabo hey. were childhood friends. Dave Sabo, one of the main guitar players, songwriters, and, and him saying, great band, but they need a singer. Now they had a singer, but they needed... They Matt needed, Fallon? Was Matt Fallon name? was the singer. Oh, it was a good singer. Um, but, uh, of course, they got Sebastian Bach, and that album went on to sell, what, five million copies or something like that. Uh, 18 in Life, I Remember You, top ten singles, uh, videos were huge. And uh, they could, for this period, they could really do no wrong. But I do remember when I would read interviews with them or see them, I remember they were on the Pepsi Power Hour on Much Music, all five of them. They seemed like guys that you could actually sit and talk Hang to. Out with. They yeah. seemed like just older versions of your friends would sit around and talk about Van Halen or talk about Aerosmith. Like they were, they were music, they, yeah, they yeah. were music fans. And I mean, yeah. it, it, also at the time, I mean, Sebastian was only well, still, <laughs> but he was only six years older than me. So it was like you don't have to be pushing thirty to make it. These guys were like they were young when they made it, and uh, I don't know. They just seemed like. I mean, obviously, lifestyles are a little bit different, but on on a very surface level, you could just sit and talk. They were music fans first and foremost. And another thing that I appreciated about this band, on that one hour special that they that aired, I, I which I watched on VHS continually, they cracked me up. I thought they were really funny. They were teasing Scotty Hill about getting sick when they were in Russia and puking <laughs> on the hotel room floor, and. Um, but they each chose videos to play in amongst okay. their own videos. Yeah. And Rob Afuso, the drummer, picked A Farewell to Kings by Rush. And that, to me, confirms, like, all right, <laughs> if this band's cool enough for Skid Row, they're cool enough for you. <laughs> so, but this this album has held up. It hasn't been that long since I listened to it all the way through. And I, I knew this would be our number one. Now, we all have it on vinyl. Unfortunately, they haven't put out any of their, they haven't reissued any of their stuff. Like, it's very, on? very strange. And there's such ongoing animosity that it's unfortunate but uh great band and uh this album will this this album has stood the test of time which you know you can still go to i think a sunrise records and pick up the disc for five bucks and you know deservedly so so there you go top 30 our picks uh what did we miss what would you have included i mean obviously there were a lot more than 30 good albums released this year but uh so andy we're gonna have you back on some episodes man it was great Thanks, Thanks for, for having me, guys. Over. Thanks for, you know, Andy picked some stuff up for us, so. Yes. Yeah. In <laughs> last minute records that didn't make the, or that made the cut, but nobody had. So, yeah. Thank you very much, folks, for watching this edition of Tim's Final Confessions.